Now that the 3 is over and people had their expectations either met, exceeded or were disappointed yet again, I would like to go down memory lane. Back in the day gaming wasn't as big as today, and although events still were a marketing ploy for fans to be hooked and reeled for the next big game that wasn't a sequel, they didn't look so blatant to me. Now I realize it was because I was young and naive, thinking games were an art form made by people who want to make something worthwhile and meaningful, and to earn part of a big corporate machine. In my eyes I still consider games to be an art form, but they've been open to the reality of what gaming was and has become. It is why I try to focus on the positive, on the creative games that I found a bit more special and dear to the already hardened heart. But back then this wasn't the case, I was looking forward to these events and they excited me very much so. I remember a certain trailer that was shown back in the distant 2006, a trailer about a game that got me very interested even though I had no idea what was going on or knew it was a spiritual successor to a franchise I never played before. A game that took us to a place deep underwater where there are no gods or kings, only man. Allow me to welcome you to Rapture. This is Bioshock. What I love about gaming is the ability to explore worlds created by people's imagination. And this is where Bioshock shines so strongly, making it one of my favorite places to visit and get immersed in. The game uses the Unreal Engine and what you're looking at is the remastered version which doesn't look that much different from the original. It has a bit better textures, but the overall tone and style have remained the same, which was what made this such a special place and so unforgettable. The artistic portrayal is what separates this game from the rest, deeply inspired by the art deco style that once was a popular design symbolizing luxury and technological progress. With this visually distinguished look, the game speaks volumes and conveys information through its environment. Set during the 1950s, this giant underwater industrial city built on a single man's dream is depressingly suffocating the player as walking through its remnants. Everywhere you look, there are buildings thematically appropriate for a city to function. The local bar where people would be hanging out for a drink or a chat. The nightclub where the lonely would be filling their eyes full of fantasies. The shopping center where people would be stuffing their bags with items trying to fill their personal void and feel happiness. Rapture has it all, because here if you have a vision, anything is possible. Graphically the game is nothing special, but because of the strong art style presence, every single place you visit is memorable, and pretty much any place you see outside of the windows is visitable, as Rapture is made into one giant abandoned playground. A city lying in ruins, its dreary atmosphere and dark tone help it become a creepy place, managing to make you feel isolated from the surface world. Sometimes the surroundings might appear bleak, forcing cowards to surrender, creating a somehow harsh atmosphere. But the one thing that age doesn't forgive as always, and even with the help of the remastered version couldn't hide, is the textures. I believe irrational games focus on creating a stunning artistic environment that resonates with personality rather than one that would push the current gen hardware. And nearly 14 years later, this is one of the most interesting virtual places someone can visit. It leaves an everlasting memory and not many games can boast about achieving such a task. Other than the visual presentation, the other key element to making this world believable and authentic is through sound. What is the difference between a man and a parasite? A man builds, a parasite asks, where is my share? A man creates, a parasite says, what will the neighbors think? A man invents, a parasite says, watch out or you might tread on the toes of God. The sound is very much an integral part of Bioshock contributing to its world building. This is happening before, at none. Why are you here? Why is it today and not then when you were warm and sweet? The highlight here has to be the voice acting. With a cast that is comprised of talented yet mostly unknown actors, it makes pretty much every encounter a joy. I just wanted the company! I was just getting warmed up! Sorry. Throughout the underwater metropolis, several main characters will guide you on your way to its conclusion. Splicer! Give him the call! 
combo. Zap them, then whack them. One two punch. Remember the one two punch. And many more will serve as a background build up for the world with the so called audio diaries. They will give us a valuable insight into the lives of the citizens of this individualistic submerged town. Gregory, don't come whining to me about market forces and don't expect me to punish citizens for showing a little initiative. If you don't like what Fontaine is doing, well, I suggest you find a way to offer a better product. Apart from the logs, you're going to be listening to announcements that keep this place a little bit more lively than it appears to be. A rapture reminder. Wanting an item from the service is forgivable. Buying or smuggling one into rapture is not. Stay on the level and out of trouble. While everything around you hints of emptiness, the occasional large and heavy footsteps from around the corner will keep you on your toes. They go along nicely with the ambience and the lack of music and sometimes make you think you're in a horror game rather than an action one. You can blame a lady who craves variety. This doesn't mean music is absent. The game features a lengthy composed soundtrack which is not what I remember Bioshock 4. It isn't bad, far from it. The use of the violin especially in the main theme is a wonderful touch, elevating everything else I like about the game. The soundtrack goes along with a lovely list of licensed music to set the tone for the decade it takes place and it is very well curated. Can't say I didn't stop to listen once or twice because I can't help it. There's something very special about these old songs and they seem to get to me one way or another. Effects are superb. Considering the whole element play we're going to touch upon in the gameplay section, nothing sounds out of place. This is where the positive stops. The one thing I don't like particularly is how the weapons sound. They're just weak. They sound as if I have corks in my ears, muffled and simply put, plain. And it's not just that, but for a deeper dive into them, we have to talk about the gameplay. Bioshock combines the FPS genre with RPG elements just like its spiritual predecessor System Shock. It isn't a full-fledged FPS RPG like the original Deus Ex for example, but still manages to give the player a variety of tools to personalize their playstyle. A game with almost no cutscenes, it presents the player with the familiar set pieces from classic games like Half-Life by showing the player firsthand what is happening while you're in control. As always, this is much more personal and serves as yet another example of how to make everything around the player look more real. The developers had fun with them, having some enemies pretend to be dead or others appear in clever and thematic way. Of course it would be better to be in control of these set pieces, but maybe one day one can dream. So, better luck next time. At heart Bioshock is a shooter with an arsenal of different weapons, but it's thanks to other things such as plasmid and tonics that keep the gameplay fresh and unique. I like that in the beginning you start without anything, this way the game sets out the tone and what it's all about. Survival. The first four weapons are nothing out of the ordinary, comprised of a wrench reminding you of a certain game, a pistol, a machine gun and a shotgun. Nothing special indeed, but what sets them apart is the ammo you can use with each one. Some are more powerful for your typical humanoid unprotected enemies, others are better for armored, big and heavy scary looking ones. For the latter I recommend the use of big hitting ones such as the grenade launcher or my personal favorite, the crossbow. It is quite overpowered and I just love the sound of the arrows when they make contact with the unfortunate opponent. <laughs> 
The only experimental weapon in the game is the chemical thrower, and it's the one I think is not needed, considering we have the same elemental plasmids already. I assume it's here so you can swap them for other ones, giving you bigger variety of how to handle your enemies. <laughs> Everything would be great if it wasn't for the janky animations of the weapons that make them a bit unsatisfying to use. Anyway I look at them, they always look stiff or silly, some even require an upgrade to perform decently and be fun. It's a bit of a disappointment but this doesn't stop the enjoyment of the overall gameplay. One of the RPG elements in Bioshock is the ability to upgrade said weapons, making them stronger and giving you an overall advantage. These upgrades are given from the power to the people vending machine, with only one possible upgrade per step station, you need to have a mental list of which upgrade you want to have first. The majority of them are 25% damage increase, but they are useful ones such as bolt breakage decrease, allowing you to recollect more fire bolts than ever before. These weapons wouldn't be fun if it wasn't for the aforementioned plasmids, the serums you inject into your body for that sweet genetic modification. They enhance the gameplay tenfold by giving you the ability to summon elemental abilities and ease your way in this underwater coffin. What I appreciate the most is the way they introduce and how well it fits with the narrative and setting. Each one has this brief slide presentation which wonderfully explains how they work as simple as possible. Freeze your enemies. Shatter them into a thousand pieces. Sadly, very few plasmids have interactive introductions, I assume the devs didn't have time to do the rest. For example, in Quarification, take the Incinerate. Before you crawl into the room, you notice a pool of few outside which serve as a setup for the plasmid. As you pick it up, the setup plays. Have another one, the telekinesis. After the brief explanation, turn around and activate the tennis ball machine to learn how it works. Immediately after that, have an enemy walk by a gas tank and suddenly... This is how I believe games should teach a player about simple yet intriguing mechanics by letting them learn on their own, with either scripted events or simple interaction. The fun you can have with plasmids is tremendous. Letting you dictate how you want to approach certain walking obstacles and expanding the playing field. Electricity is key in many situations, since the whole underwater prison we're in is leaking a little bit, and those pools of water you so often come across serve a great purpose. If you like things hot, lighting enemies on fire is fun, especially when you follow them screaming to see them trying to extinguish themselves. It is your... Wanna play ping pong elementals with them, freeze them, melt them and freeze them again, or simply shatter them to pieces after freezing them completely. It's such a joy watching them crumble into tiny pieces. The very few issues I've come across were with said telekinesis. Something about registering the object I want to be put wasn't working properly and in the end I didn't bother much using it. Thankfully the others worked well. There are lots of plasmids to choose from, the rest you'll be getting from the so-called shop Gatherer's Garden, the place for your genetic splicing needs with the so-called Adam. What that essentially is, is a substance that rewrites your genetic code or in my favorite playing terms, gives you unlimited power. So if you want to be powerful, you have to fight. Not these splicers who still hit hard, but something bigger. Here's where Bioshock presents the dilemma of how bad do you want this power. Bad enough to fight a big daddy? These massive beings in a diving suit serve as a wall between you and these little unthreatening children called little sisters. And they have the thing that you desperately want. The big daddies are the toughest enemies here and they present quite a challenge. The 
They serve as mini bosses because the game only has one, which is at the end. Other than Big Daddy's enemy variety is quite limited. You only have a few different splicers and if you rig an alarm, the security bots or turrets. The early stages of the game are the hardest if played on the last difficulty setting called Survivor and if you want a bigger challenge, you can choose the impossible and disable the Vita Chambers which in my opinion only make the game painfully easy, no matter of the difficulty. They respawn the character whenever defeated and serve as a checkpoint minimizing the loading, so you promptly disable it and begin to save like mad. This is how games should be. What else you can upgrade with Adam is the Gene Tonics, but the only difference between between them and the plasmids is that the tonics powers are passive. So for example you want tougher body, equip the armored shell or if you want more heat, get the human inferno and watch your poor victims burn to a crisp. Another way for you to upgrade these powers is by the use of the research camera. It's quite a refreshing take on the whole finding a weakness in your enemy by simply taking a picture of it. Gives you an incentive to risk your life by walking close to a dangerous enemy while they're trying to downright murder you. I like the idea a lot, but the whole process of you taking the photo, showing you the ranking and giving you the award is painstakingly long. And because there are many levels to each enemy you're trying to research, at some point I felt I was strong enough and just didn't bother taking photos anymore. Besides a photographer, you'll be a hacker as well since there are plenty of cameras and turrets spread throughout Rapture. Hacking is this mini game similar to the old classic Pipe Mania, where you have to use the different tiles to make a path from the start to the end, circumnavigating alarms and traps. There are several tonics to help you reduce the hacking difficulty or freezing it to slow the flow, but even with them, sometimes, no matter how easy it is, some hacking scenarios are impossible and thus you receive a pleasant shock. So make sure you stack on automatic hacking tools or just pay up. The game doesn't have a status screen where you can see how strong you are, or an inventory for that matter since you'll be collecting a lot of stuff. One thing is money, which is vital for survival. Although plenty of useful items such as first aid kits and EVE hypos are scattered around, it's wise to stack up on some dough. There are these wonderful vending machines to help you around, with their unique whimsical themes you'll be begging to get out of your head. The other thing you'll be collecting is scrap. As the old adage goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure. This junk is used for crafting things such as the automatic hacking tools and ammo for your weapons from the you invent vending machine, which you're going to need if you're playing on a higher difficulty. With everything combined, Bioshock is a well-oiled machine, with enough components to keep the players engaged in its gameplay. But there's another part that drives it, the story. I remember when we were on the precipice of potential that games had when it came to storytelling. Bioshock served as one of those games that did something different and showed us how you can tell an engaging story where the lack of choice on what happens is crucial, to a point. Played today, I believe it still manages to hold strong, but it will never have the same impact as it did when it played for the first time. The game tells the story of Jack, who is on board an airplane that suddenly crashes into the middle of the ocean. This is where I stop and say, if you haven't played it and want to avoid spoilers, go here. Otherwise, let's jump in. What I love about Bioshock is that it amplifies and underlines how we have no choice in most games in its narrative, in which the driving force is its characters that with almost no interaction breed so much life in this forsaken world. Imagine the will it took to create a place like this. And what have you built? Nothing. You can only loot and break. You're not a man. You're just a termite at the side. 
the name Andrew Ryan has a tremendous volume among people familiar with this interactive medium and serves as an example of how to create a truly outstanding villain. Even though he's not the person who the player ultimately fights in the grand finale and is not the driving force behind the player's actions, he is the one responsible for the sunken city of dreams rapture. Everything revolves around him, including the man who keeps guiding you around, Atlas. He's a trustworthy fellow who helps you navigate this place after your accident and just wants to escape this hellhole with his family. I know you must feel like the unluckiest man in the world right now, but you're the only hope I'll ever see my wife and child again. Go to Neptune's bounty, find my family, please. Until they're murdered by Andrew Ryan himself. <laughs> This makes Atlas seek revenge, but because he's powerless, he sends us after him. Eventually we reach Andrew's Ryan office, and of course, one can't forget the chilling scene that serves as the story's breaking point, and it is revealed we were mere puppets. Stop, would you kindly? Would you kindly? Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? After this point I believe it's where the game becomes a bit less interesting, with the review of Atlas being Frank Fontaine who had her strings dangling from his hands all along, wanting rapture all for himself. Everything is revealed in a single instance and thanks to Dr. Deus Ex Machina, I mean Tenenbaum, the person who made Adam possible, we manage to escape. Afterward she manages to cut one string, while Fontaine seems unable to stop us from getting the only thing that can let us cut off his clutches completely. Freeing ourselves, we start chasing him until we reach a wall that conveniently can be bypassed only by becoming a big daddy. Which in itself I have to say is fun, excluding the claustrophobic feeling you get when you put that helmet on. And thus we reach Frank Fontaine, who serves as a final boss and unfortunately he's kinda silly. Not only that, but he's quite easy to defeat. <laughs> Draining him completely out of Adam, the story concludes based on choices that the game shouldn't have been about, but depending on if you harvested or saved all the little sisters, you can get two different endings. This is the biggest problem I have with Bioshock, because it contradicts the narrative of the game that dictates the player has no choice in his actions, and ultimately erases the initial impressions you're left thinking and contemplating, making everything you've been shown and told completely invalid. While I dislike this very much, it still manages to tell an engaging and forgettable story, even though ruined once again by a publisher who didn't know better. Bioshock is a wonderful time capsule, a gem lying on the ocean floor next to great games waiting to be found by players who want more than the empty open world collectathons we are constantly getting. A game that stands on the shoulders of an amazing city, waiting to be explored and appreciated for what it tried to be presenting such an intriguing and interesting narrative that manages still to this day to keep me captivated even though it wasn't my first dive. You have a pretty good shooter that blends with a few RPG elements, making the game a bit more personal by allowing the player to customize their playstyle. It might leave players desiring more today, but overlooking that and the blatantly obvious flaws, it's a really enjoyable game with a decent difficulty if you're looking for that. There have been a lot of games since it, some that had an even bigger impact, but Bioshock will forever remain special, not for having revolutionary gameplay or memorable boss fights, but for the world it gave us. Because sometimes you can look past certain imperfections and be engrossed by everything around you. Bioshock is like your favorite snow globe you have on your shelf. Every time you pick it up and shake it, you imagine you're right there. <laughs>